Welcome to Arden Livestream. I'm Timothy, I'm one of the pastors here. We are so delighted that you decided to worship with us at Arden First Baptist. If you are new, please let us know. You can send us a direct message right here on social, or you can email the church office at office at ardenfbc.com. A little preview, the service lasts about 70 to 75 minutes. There'll be a wonderful time of worship as Pastor Joe leads us in some amazing vertical worship. And I'll have the wonderful privilege of taking you through the Bible verse by verse in a way that's relevant and practical. So let's prepare our hearts as we get ready for worship today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to worship you. We ask and pray that you would bless this worship as we sing and as we hear your word preach, that we would just apply it to our lives and that you would help us to be transformed through the renewing of our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. church how are you today we just want to say welcome if you are visiting I'd love a chance to get to meet you after service uh, we have a resource room just down the hallway and I would love just to get a chance so come by and see me for a few minutes I'm excited because we're going to be back in the book of Revelation how many of you have missed the book of Revelation all right so um, yeah we went through an Easter series and whatnot and we're glad to be back for those of you who are just joining us we have all of our services online, so you can catch up, veg out on the book of Revelation, you know, uh, listen to the podcast or whatnot. So we're going to be Revelation 4, so go ahead and turn there. As you turn there, how many of you are planning travel plans for the summertime? All right, how many of you are undecided where you're going to go? You're still looking for places to go. All right, so I, I did a little research, want to be your travel agent today. These are the top five places that people are traveling. You ready? I'm going to go down number five down to number one. Number five is Tahiti. So you think about this beautiful little island. Think about over the waters, catching some fish. Wow, it's going to be amazing. Number four, Bora Bora. Now, it's one of the smaller of the French Polynesian islands, but it's supposed to be one of the most amazing experiences, the, the soft sand under your feet, snorkeling, tropical fish. Anybody want to go there? All right. Number three is Maui. I've been told that you can go water diving and snorkeling with sea turtles in Maui. That would be amazing. And they have uh, pokey, they have mahi-mahi, for those of you who like the Hawaiian fish. How many of you would like a little mahi-mahi today? All right, I'm making you hungry. Number two is where my kids want to go to one day, Paris. How many of you have been to Paris? All right, well, I'll have to get travel tips. You know, the, the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, all those are amazing. What I'm looking forward to if I get a chance to go there is those little cafes. You walk down the cobblestone side roads and eat a croissant and have a latte with your loved ones. You ready to go there, Lori? All right, we've got to save up. And number one, I wasn't familiar with this, but South Island, New Zealand. The picture says it all. And you can even explore glaciers there, icebergs, whatnot, and it's just fascinating. So when you look at these travel destinations, I want to tell you that these are all very dim in comparison to the travel destination that lies ahead for every believer. Where, where am I talking about? I'm talking about heaven. The Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, but God has revealed it through his spirit. You know, we, we, we think about what God has in store. We, we haven't fully understood it, but the spirit has revealed certain things about heaven. In Revelation 4, we're going to get a picture of what heaven is like. For some of you who get kind of weirded out when you think about heaven, it's because you've heard wrong information about heaven. How many of you have heard of heaven as like you're floating around in clouds, playing a harp, 
Or for those of you who have ADHD, you think of heaven as like eternal worship service and you're like, I can't sit through an hour of church. How am I gonna make it through heaven, right? But see, those are all misunderstandings. And there were two people in the Bible, in the New Testament at least, that had an understanding of heaven, went to heaven, lived to talk about it. Paul was one, he had a vision, he got called up into the third heaven, but he said God wouldn't let him talk about it. He had a vision, whether in the body, out of the body, he didn't know, but he's like, God wouldn't let me talk about it. But we're thankful that John in the book of Revelation was transported into heaven in his spiritual person and he was told to write about it. So the next two weeks, we're gonna give you a sneak peek into what heaven is like. So if you're not turning your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation 4. And we wanna welcome those online. We're so thankful that you're here. So Revelation 4, we're gonna read the whole chapter and then we're gonna look at a sneak peek of heaven. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit. So pause there. He wants you to know that it was not a body experience. He was in the spirit. He had this vision and God in the spirit allowed him to experience this. All right, continue on. Behold, a throne set in heaven and one set on the throne. So this is God the Father here. And he who sat on there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So before we read verse four, how many of you have ever wondered what God the Father looks like, right? You're like, you know, you've, you've thought about Jesus a lot, but you're like, Does it, has anyone ever seen God? You know, has anyone ever seen God and lived? And what John's gonna do, he's gonna paint a picture and God the Father in the spiritual realm, which we can't see the Father because we're not there yet in the spiritual form, but he was able to see the Father in a way that he couldn't really put it into words. And we're gonna break down these different jewels that he talks about that he just, he can't find human language to describe how stunning and how beautiful God the Father is. In verse four, and there were 24 thrones and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So we, we see this throne room here, and we see 24 elders, and they're wearing gold crowns. And it's like, wow, you, you see this majestic picture. And verse 5, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, I want you to underline lightning, thunderings, and voices. Every time I've read this, even as a, a teenager and adult, I always thought that was kind of weird. Like, why would God have lightning and thundering in heaven? We're going to talk about it in a little bit. There's some science that I want to present to you that's kind of fascinating as I studied this. Verse 6, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures. Now notice the description, full of eyes in the front and in the back. So think about these creatures, how it's like they're not as any creatures, they have eyes. Now, if you've never thought of someone that has more than two eyes, think about your mom. She had eyes in the back of her head, right? She saw things that you're like, how did you know? So these living creatures have eyes all around their body. Every area of their body, they had ability to see. And notice the description, it gets even more interesting. The first, verse seven, the first living creature was like a lion. The second little cr living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures each had six wings, were full of eyes around and within and they do not rest day or night saying, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were 
created. May God bless his word. So today I want to give you a little sneak peek of what heaven is going to be like. And this is going to shatter a lot of her preconceived ideas of heaven. For those of you who are like, I want to live as long as I can because I'm not so sure about heaven. After you see what John presents to us, you're like, I'm kind of looking forward to heaven because this place is going to be unbelievable. So the first sneak peek is this. Heaven is a perfect place that is presently in another realm. If you look back at verse 1, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And I heard a voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. So I want to draw a contrast. If you read Revelation 3, towards the end, Revelation 3.20, we see Jesus knocking on a what type of door? It's a closed door, right? The church at Laodicea had kicked Jesus out in a, in a sense. They, he didn't feel welcome in his own church. So he's knocking on the door, let me in. But you go to Revelation 4, and it's not an earthly door. There's a door open in heaven. And this is, this is kind of a picture of John being called up into glory. And this is where Christians, other passages, understand the concept of the rapture. You guys ever heard of the rapture of the church? And you're like, well, where does this come from? Well, Revelation 119, if you're taking notes, you may want to write that down. It outlines the entire book of Revelation. Jesus says, I want you to write down the things which you have seen, that's Revelation 1, the things which are, that's Revelation 2 and 3, and the things which will take place after this, that's Revelation 4 through 22. So right now we're in the Revelation 4 through 22, the things that will take place after this. So this open door represents the time is now for salvation. There's an open door. Jesus is inviting everyone everywhere to be saved. He's inviting them to accept his free gift of salvation so that you can go to heaven, right? That's the only way, friends. There's no other way. New age will not get you to heaven. Other religions will not get you to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father. No one goes to heaven except through me. So right now there's an open door. So let's talk about the rapture. What is the rapture of the church? The rapture of the church is mentioned the understanding of the rapture of the church is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. And we get the imagery here in Revelation because the church is mentioned in 2 and 3. And you notice Revelation 4 all the way to the end of the book, Revelation 19, the church is not mentioned until the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you're like, why is the church not mentioned in the tribulation? Does anybody know? Because we're not going to be there, right? That's the good news. So look in your listening guide at 1 Thessalonians 4. I want to give you the understanding of what the rapture is and where it comes from in the Bible. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the scripture says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So the context of the rapture, the, Thessal the church at Thessalon Thessalonica were concerned about loved ones who had died. They're like, what happens to them? And Paul is basically saying that whenever you die, guess what? Your body is in a state of sleep. Your soul and your spirit are with the Lord. Paul says in another place, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what happens to your body, it goes to ashes, right? And whenever the rapture takes place, it says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And if, if, if we're still alive, we're going to meet him in the air. That's the idea of rapture. So continue on. He explains a little more in detail. He says in verse 15, For this we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, those who have already died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. So underline that word, caught up together, those words. We shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. So it's, the word caught up is this Greek word harpazo. Someone say harpazo. We have this on the screen here. 
This is what it means in the original language. It means to seize or to snatch, to catch up, to take something by force, to snatch away. So here's what's going to happen whenever, whenever the end time comes to a specific moment. We don't know when that moment is, but whenever the tribulation is about to begin, what will happen is Jesus will not set foot on earth at that point. He will be in the sky. He will be in the air. And those of us who are still alive and believers, we will be captured away. We'll be called up to, to meet him. Wouldn't that be so cool? Like just... I mean, it's just like to think about it, it just kind of blows your mind away. And in John 14, Jesus kind of gave allusion to this in another passage. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. Literally, it's dwelling places. And he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. And in verse 3, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So something that will help us understand, some of you, this rapture and all this may be a foreign concept. We don't talk a lot about it, but you have to go back to Jewish wedding customs. Has anybody ever been to a Jewish wedding before? Very fascinating, isn't it? But I want you to go back to the first century Jewish weddings. Obviously, culture changes, but in first century Jewish weddings, there was a three-step process. The first one was betrothal. That's where we'd call engagement. Then after the betrothal, the husband-to-be would go get his bride, snatch his bride, and then they would be together. It'd be like this huge seven-day wedding feast. It's called the wedding supper. Could usually last seven days. So I want to back up a little bit. Betrothal. Did you know that right now we are betrothed to Christ? We are his bride-to-be. And in that day and time in Jewish custom, whenever you would be betrothed, you would pay a, a bridal price, and this was basically to compensate the loss that the father would experience, the, the bride's father, because she would be going to a new household. You would pay this price, you would shower the bride and her family with gifts, and then you would say, I'll be back, I'm going to my father's house, prepare a room for us, and whenever everything's ready, I'm gonna come back. And I'm going to come back at a time you don't know. So think about now what has happened. Jesus has paid the price. We just sang the song with his blood. And he said, I'm going to prepare a place. This is Jewish talk for I'm at the Father's house. I'm preparing rooms for all of you. And whenever the room was ready, the, the, the husband-to-be would look at the father and the father would be like, all right, time's now. Go get your bride. And here's what would happen in first century Jewish culture the Jewish husband-to-be would go in the night. He would have all his friends, his entourage of friends with him. And they would be blowing shofars, and it would be loud and noisy. And they would make their procession to the future bride's home. And she had to be ready. She didn't know when he was coming. Whenever they heard the blow of the shofar, she would come out. They would snatch the bride away. They would, have, they would consummate their marriage. And they would have a seven-day wedding feast. So I want you to see the, the illustration in the New Testament. Jesus has paid the price for us. We, we are betrothed to Christ. One day, he's going to snatch us away. That's heaven. That's the rapture. In the Jewish wedding feast, it lasted usually seven days. How long is the tribulation going to last on earth? Seven years. During that time, we're going to be with Christ in heaven, enjoying something that's mentioned in Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Isn't that amazing? When you look at Jewish custom, you're like, oh, now it makes sense. It, it comes out of that custom and that culture. So when we read verse 1, this open door, I want you guys to get that the door is open, that we need to present the gospel to every man, woman, student, and child because there's an open door in heaven. But one day that door will be closed. And you're like, when is the door closed? Well, whenever someone dies, that door is closed. There's no chance to accept Christ after you die. When the rapture takes place, then everyone that's going to be left behind, they still could get saved. But can you imagine going through seven years of all hell on earth? I mean, no one wants to go through that. So it's an open door. So that's why we are so passionate about asking people to accept Christ because the, the door is open. Today is the day of salvation. And I want you to think about the best day of your life. For those of you who have been born again, you've experienced the best day of your life. 
The second best day of your life should be the day when you get married, right? The third best day should be the day when you have kids. But I want to propose to you that you've not yet experienced the best day of your life that you will experience. And what day is that? That will be the day when you spend your first day in forever with Jesus. That will be the best day of your life because you're going to meet the one who loved you, who gave himself for you. You've not yet experienced the best day of your life because you haven't seen Jesus face to face. And when you experience heaven, it's just going to be something that you will just, it will blow your mind away. It's going to be so amazing. All right, second sneak peek. Heaven will be the greatest experience that will go on joyfully forever. So in verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne sat in heaven. This throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So in Revelation chapter 4, the word throne is mentioned 14 times. So the idea is that this is all about God's sovereignty. He is high and lifted up. And you notice his position, he is sitting on a throne. Sometimes we think that God is worried about what's going on here on earth. If that was the case, we'd see God pacing the throne room. What is going on? Look at my children down there. They're messing it up. Look at the world. Look at all the stuff in the world. But he's not pacing. He is sitting on the throne, which means God's got it all under control. Like the old children's song says, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's not pacing. He's not worried because he has a plan. He has a plan. And I want you to get this description of God. We often are like, what is God the Father like? If we could go to heaven and just get a glimpse of what he's like, it, you will be able to experience him in his fullness. So it gives this description. It said the Father, when, when John saw him, he said he was like a jasper stone. You're like, what is a jasper stone? Look at the person next to you. What is a jasper stone? What is it? Well, it's a clear gem. It's kind of like the easiest gem we would describe. It's kind of like a diamond. So when John looks at God the Father in his spiritual form, his body's not there, his body's still on the island of Patmos, he says, when I saw God, I can't really put it in description, but it reminded me the dazzling beauty of diamonds. So for all you ladies who have a diamond, when you look at the diamond, you just think God is so much more beautiful than this. I, he, it just blows me away. How many of you have ever studied a lot about science and other planets? All right, we've got some scientists out there. Did you know that scientists believed, and they say they've proven it, but they haven't been there, but they, according to their research, that in Neptune and Uranus, it rains diamonds. Did you know that? Google it, look it up. It rains diamonds in these planets. And you're like, how does that, I'm not a scientist, I don't want to explain it, but here, here's the big idea. We serve a God that's so creative, so masterful, so powerful, that he makes streets out of gold, that he, when he wants to do something pretty creative and amazing, he's like, I want it to rain diamonds in Neptune. Let it rain diamonds. And me and my mindset, I kind of get it from my, my wife. She's kind of like, she likes to try new things. She's an entrepreneur. So sometimes I'm like, okay, what if I could build a spaceship, go to Uranus, and I could get all those diamonds. I could come back, I could pay off everyone's debt, and everyone would have a new car. Wouldn't that be cool? You're like, the cost of building a spaceship, you know, the time it hits the ground, are the diamonds melted? There's so much we don't know, right? But just flow with me here. But notice this, this gem, it's like a da jasper stone. And then it says the second one, like a sardius stone. This is a translucent red stone. This was the first stone in the breastplate of the high priest in the Old Testament. The high priest had a breastplate, and this was the first of the stone. And then we see this rainbow. What, is this, what color is this rainbow? Emerald. What color is emerald? How many of you have ever seen a fully green rainbow? We've seen green in the rainbow. You've never seen a green rainbow. So my... my uh, crazy mind sometimes likes to investigate things, so I begin to think through, is there anything on planet Earth that would resemble green light? Has anybody ever heard of the northern lights, right? We got a little video here with some interesting music, but does anybody know what causes the green lights of the northern lights? What's that? 
radio waves, atmosphere, and when you, when you kind of break it down, it's a very complicated scientific thing. I'll let the scientists explain, but the sun emits these particles. Air shield around the earth um, prevents those particles from hitting planet earth, but the scientists believe that on the northern and southern hemisphere, the, the protection, protective shield's weaker, so they get through. So as they hit the atmosphere, it excites these particles in the air, and it creates an electromagnetic field and you're like, okay, what's the big deal about electromagnetic magne- magnetic field? An electromagnetic field is something that we see take place after lightning storms, okay? When you read Revelation 4, it says that there's thunder and lightning and voices, and I always thought that was kind of weird as a kid, like, why would there be lightning in heaven, okay? And notice the results. Notice one of the things. There is this green rainbow around God's throne. And it's like we see this with, even on earth, certain pictures of this electromagnetic field. So like when you read Revelation, it's like thunder and lightning. You're like, oh, that's different. But now you're like, now I could see where the green rainbow comes from. Isn't that cool? So like when you read the Bible and you look at science and and it lines up, you're like, wow, the Bible is true no matter what. But now science is like showing things out of scripture and you're like wow how how cool is that so when you look at the northern lights why do people look at them in such wonder why are you in such in wonder of green lights right why why is that maybe it's because you were created to experience something greater than what you're presently experiencing maybe it's because god is a creative master masterful worker And he, because he's the creator, he's a creative genius. And whenever you see green lights in the sky that don't belong there, you're like, wow, let's call the the northern lights. And whenever you get to heaven and you see a green rainbow, and by the way, in the Bible, rainbow is a symbol of God's promise that he won't destroy, destroy the earth, but it's only a half rainbow. Notice in heaven, this is not a half rainbow, it's a full rainbow. And I'm borrowing this from Warren Wearsby, by the way, not original. So look at your footnotes when it's not original. I try to quote it. But he said, rainbows come after a storm, right? In Revelation 4, we see a rainbow coming before the storm. And this is an example, an illustration that God shows mercy and grace even preceding judgment. Amen. There's an open door in heaven, like, come on, accept him. So see, Revelation's cool and exciting. When you actually read it and you're like, wow. That's what that is. So Wearsby, and we have this quote on the screen, we're going to talk about these creatures. Let's go ahead and put the quote. These creatures seem to represent all of creation with its ultimate redemption in Christ. So we see this rainbow, and then we're going to see these creatures. And that brings us to point number three on your listening, God. Heaven is a place of wonder and creative holiness. It's a place of wonder and creative holiness. So in verse 6, It gets even more descriptive. There's a sea of glass like crystal. And you're like, why would God have have this sea of glass? Like, why would it be crystal clear? And my mind takes me back to teenage days. You guys remember, our teenagers, one of the most popular things with your car is to tint your windows. How many of you tinted your windows as a teenager? Why did you tint your windows? A little privacy, right? You don't want to know what's going on inside. A little privacy. So here's the thing, why is it crystal clear? And I think one of the things is God has nothing to hide. He is so beautiful, he is so perfect, he's majestic in holiness, he's perfect in love, and everything around him demonstrates that God is so holy, so pure, so set apart, he has nothing to hide. So you see this crystal sea. And then back to the creatures that we quoted from Warren Wearsby, what is the deal with these four creatures with eyes all around them? And the only thing I could think of with these creatures is that God wanted these creatures to have eyes all around them so they could take in his majesty, his beauty. And here's the thing, no one can fully take in God. It's impossible. But as much as they're able to take in, most scholars believe that these are angelic beings, that they just want to take in the beauty and the splendor of all God is. And I want you to look at these creatures. Who are these creatures? Who are these angelic ones? Well, reference, if you're taking notes, Ezekiel 1, verses 10 through 13. He has a vision of these creatures that are almost identical. 
And on your listening guide, I kind of break it down into the four things. These creatures point us to how amazing God is. First of all, the lion. Because the lion is the king of the jungle, this creature that resembles a lion points us to the fact that God is king. He is king. And he rules and he reigns and he's sovereign. Okay, a calf in Ezekiel's vision, it was an ox. So it could be a calf or an ox. What does that represent? It represents God's strength. God is almighty. He is omnipotent. There's nothing too hard for him. He can do anything. When he breathes, stars are created. Whenever heaven gets a little excited, all of a sudden, electromagnetic field, green rainbow is happening. And I began to think, and this is for Pastor Joe. He can thank me later. A lot of times people struggle with worship environments like, are, are we being too excited? Are we, being, are we solemn enough? Are we, if you read Revelation 4 and 5, there's a light show going on. There's loud noises. There's thundering. And then you read in other places, there's smoke. So here's the thing. If you've ever like, I don't know if I can worship to that. You might want to try other experiences because heaven is going to be an exciting place. Lights and sound and smoke. All my teenagers are like, amen. <laughs> Some of us may have to adjust a little bit to heaven because it's a pretty exciting place. So you notice that these creatures, and by the way, uh, like a man, the third one is like a man, that's God's intelligence. He's omniscient, he's all-knowing. And then like an eagle, this is God's majestic perspective. Think about an eagle soaring and seeing all of the world. And to you practical, it helps you understand you may be stuck in a situation, but God, he's seeing everything. He's seeing what's happening in your life. Like an eagle, he has a majestic perspective. And you can trust in his kindness. You can trust in his goodness. You can trust that he has a plan. Amen? And then these creatures are doing something very unique. They are talking about how God is holy, how he's almighty, how he's always present. And this points us back to Isaiah 6, if you're taking notes. This is the seraphim. It reminds us of the seraphim. And notice what the song of the seraphim is, and you see this in uh, this passage. It's God is holy, holy, holy. And by the way, we value all of God's attributes. We don't want to minimize or emphasize one above the other. But here's the thing. Holiness is the only one that's mentioned in a, a, a trifecta three times. The most attribute that we love the most is God is love, right? But it never says God is love, love, love. It says he's holy, holy, holy. So here's the, here's the application. You can't understand love until you understand holiness. Because if it's not holy, then it's not love, okay? So holiness is this just anchor that we think about with God. If, if, if I understand holiness, I can fully better understand, never fully understand, but better understand God's love. If I understand holiness, I can better understand God's mercy, that a holy God can't tolerate sin, but because of his love, he shows mercy. And you think about God's attributes, they're all 100% of every quality. We can't just minimize, all oh, God is love. Well, he is love, but he's also holy. He is just, but he's also a God of mercy. So as Christians, we have, to, we have to embrace all 66 books of the Bible, and we have to embrace all of God's attributes. We can't just fall in love with one to the exclusion of the other because that creates a caricature out of God. And we need to embrace all of God through all of his word. Can I get amen? So it brings us to number four. Heaven is a place of heartfelt worship. Notice in verse nine, it says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, Notice what these 24 elders do. They throw their, 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 their crowns. They cast the crowns and says, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. So for my worship team up here, this is what you call 3D worship, worship in 3D. What is worship in 3D? When you look at the scripture here, first of all, glory. You give God glory. What is glory? A lot of times we think of glory as like celebrity, stars, when we're talking about the glory of God, we're talking about the fullness of all his characteristics. Just like I mentioned, holy and love and, and just. Like we embrace all of God. That's, that's, that's the glory of God. And then you read the second trait here in the scripture, honor. Honor means that we reverence and respect God. And yes, it is exciting in heaven, but it's not a flippant worship. It's I honor God. I don't take him lightly. And then thanks. 
Whenever you're worshipful, you also are thankful because you thank God of who he is, of all he's done. We are thankful to God. In fact, Colossians 1.17, this is a beautiful description about the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Did you know the reason why your life's not falling apart is Jesus is holding your world together? Did you know the reason why you're here today is Jesus is holding your life together? Did you know the reason why you don't have to stress or fret? Because he's holding it together. So when you see this almighty, omnipotent God sitting on a throne with rainbow of green around him, with these crazy looking creatures, eyes all around them, saying how great he is, let's not let the angels steal all your praise. Let us rise up and say, angels, you can sing glory, but we're gonna sing glory down here too. You can have excitement up in the throne room, but guess what? We're going to have a little bit of heaven here on earth because we have the kingdom inside of us. And whenever you worship God in spirit and in truth, that's what God calls worship. So it can be with excitement. It can be with passion and energy. I don't want any any rock or stone to take my praise. I don't want just the angels to sing. I want to lift up my voice to the king. To God be the glory. It's been said that there's three surprises you'll find in heaven. First surprise is who is there. Second surprise is who's not there. And the third surprise is that you're there. Those are three surprises in heaven. (laughs) So to summarize today's passage in one big idea, if you got lost in the green rainbow or raining diamonds, if you got lost in any of that, here's the big idea. The best day of your life has not happened yet. It will be the first day with Jesus in eternity. That's the best day. So because prophecy is practical, some people don't like studying prophecy because they're like, I'm worried about paying my light bill. Listen, prophecy is practical. Let me make it practical. Three steps. Action step number one is that we should start living in hope. If there is an open door in heaven, if you are born again, it doesn't matter what happens to you on earth because you have a home in heaven. You have a place of grace and glory. I can't wait till I get to experience heaven. There's emotions that you've never experienced. There's colors that you've never seen. And if you don't get to travel much here on earth, that's okay, because heaven, you'll get to travel. Think about why did God create Pluto, Uranus, Neptune, all these planets? We don't fully know, but we can speculate. A good possibility is you'll get to go there. you get to travel. You'll get to see God's glory. And everywhere you go, every place you explore, it's going to say, wow, it's raining diamonds. How cool is that? God, you're good. The glory of God is everywhere. We just have to take it in. The second step is live for eternity. And as we talk about heaven, there has to be a warning about hell. Nobody likes to talk about hell, but it's a real place. The truth about hell, it wasn't created for humans. It was created for the devil and his angels. So if anyone goes there, it's because they are rejecting what Jesus did for them on the cross. And you have to receive it. It's not universalism. It's not everybody goes because Jesus died. No, Jesus died to make a way. But you have to receive it. The the blood is not applied to you unless you receive the blood, unless you receive the forgiveness. And how do you do that? It's believing the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. And the third day, what happened? He rose again. And you receive that, and because you receive that, your life is changed. That's the gospel. And finally, number three, live worshiping. What if earth was like a dress rehearsal for heaven? A lot of times we think of heaven that you know everything. Now, you're going to be perfect. There's no sin. But the Bible never says you'll know everything in heaven. This is just speculation. I'm just thinking out loud. But what if some of us have to go to remedial classes, remedial classes about worship? When we get to heaven, you're like, whoa, this is, all right, there's no sins, and maybe I can enter in and just, you know, think about it. It's okay to raise your hands. It's okay to give God thanks. I I don't know if that's the case, but I don't want to have to go to remedial school about worship in heaven. I want to practice here so when I get to the other side, my hands are already lifted when I get up there, right? There's going to be a big adjustment for all of us, but think about it. This is dress rehearsal. God is preparing us down here so that we're ready to be with him forever, amen? So next week, Mother's Day, all come dressed up. We're taking pictures of everybody for the directory. And in addition to honoring our mothers, we're going to be in Revelation 5. So read ahead. It's going to be exciting. The, the lamb is also a lion. It's going to be a really cool passage. I'm excited.
Let's pray. Father, we have seen green rainbows. We have seen planets raining diamonds. We have thought about your goodness and your glory and your grace. And God, it makes us feel really small, like so tiny. But God, that's the purpose of your word. It makes us realize that we're nothing apart from you. But because of your grace, you reach out, you call us your own. So no one looking around, I want to talk to believers first, born-again believers. If you do believe in the reality of heaven, the question is, who are you taking with you? Who are you sharing Christ with? Do you have lost family members, friends that there's an open door? Are you trying to invite them through that door? Are you inviting them to salvation? If not, tell God that you want to start doing that. Ask him to forgive you for not being a witness of the gospel. As believers pray, there may be one here today that you've got a, a brief understanding of the holiness of God, that he is holy, and you and I, we're not. The Bible says we're sinners and we need to be saved. And to, to have that forgiveness applied to you, to have that, your name written in heaven, you have to make a decision. It's not universalism. You have to decide for yourself. If you've never asked Jesus to forgive you and you've never really turned your life over to him, I want you to pray this prayer while you're sitting. For those online right where you're at, I want you to pray this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, I believe the good news that you died and you rose again. And Jesus, I wanna, I wanna ask that you would forgive me. I, I confess that I'm a sinner and I wanna receive your forgiveness. I wanna receive the gift of life. So Jesus, take me as your own. Adopt me into your family. I wanna choose to live for you from this day forward. With no one looking around, did anyone pray that prayer today? Just slip up your hand. I want to celebrate with you. Anyone pray that prayer? Anyone at all? If you did, please let us know. Father, you are good, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I hope that you were blessed by the time of worship through music and the message. And as we like to say at Arden, we don't teach just for information. We teach for transformation. I want to encourage you, if this is your first time joining us at this live stream, click your connection card that's showing up on your screen now. We'd love just to get to know you a little bit. If you'll give us your email address, we'll send you more info about the church. And for those of you who are regular attendees to Arden on the Go, we'd love for you to celebrate what God is doing through giving. You can click on the giving link and give safely and securely. We just want you to know that your giving fuels this mission. And also we'd encourage you to take your next steps, whatever that looks like. For some of you, it's baptism. For others of you, it's getting part of community in a small group. For others of you, it's talking to one of our leaders. So go ahead and click the next steps link on your screen. And we wanna help you take that next step. Well, until next week, know that your best days in Christ are not behind you. Your best days are right in front of you. We'll see you next Sunday.